got a YouTube video, so uh, we'll see if we can get that for you, John. Um, first, I, you know, a little bit on this talk, it isn't intended to be a lecture. I'm not here to, to lecture. It's intended to start a conversation around uh, this idea of can agriculture be a restoration tool? Um, in a lot of ways, there, there already are great examples of that uh, happening, but uh, we'll take a look at what I think is a really exciting opportunity um, to do that. Um, for me, Anna mentioned I'm a soil scientist, so everything starts from the soil in my world uh, that I work with, and, and that's true in my programs too. I, I started a, a new agriculture systems management program at MATC this year. Uh, if you're not familiar, MATC covers the 12, touches the 12 counties around Dane County. Uh, our, our college districts are set up by school districts, so we have 40 um, local school districts that make up our, our METC school districts. So you don't get county boundaries. It gets a little confusing that way if you think in county government a lot. A lot of people do. We don't operate that way. We're in school district. Um, but that's, if you have more questions about that, we can talk about that. In a minute, I, I sent this to Anna. I don't know a couple months ago. I thought, well, would you be interested in this? And I, as I've been getting ready for today, I, I was thinking, some of you might be thinking, why would you talk about agriculture to the Elder Leopold Foundation folks? And what, why us? You're doing a lot of great work in restoration, in a lot of different areas. So, um, well, right now, I believe we're at a point where we really, we really have an opportunity to do a paradigm shift and make great change in how we treat the land uh, in agriculture, uh, through agriculture. As you probably are all well aware, most of our land is in Wisconsin and, and around the nation is privately held, and a lot of that is managed through agriculture. Um, and a lot of that is in corn and soybeans, which we're going to talk a little bit about in a couple minutes. But um, the way we manage that land isn't always the best for uh, what we can do environmentally. Um, so I'm going to present an idea that maybe we can make some of those changes together. And the reason that I wanted to talk to you all about that, uh, many of you, uh, Elder Leopold, from Elder Leopold right on through people here today, have been working and making change in policy and, and practices forever. So I think in order to really make the changes we need to, that I think we need to in agriculture, I'm saying we need your help. We need everybody's help. Everybody has to think about this a little bit differently. So um, that's that was really my intent of uh, coming and talking about this. Um, agriculture starts with the soil, right? Uh, in the introduction I mentioned, we'll do just a little brief history of conservation and agriculture, and I'm going to do that by looking at uh, NRCS, which is uh, the federal USDA um, agriculture restoration uh group. They're, they're responsible for the federal parts of, of agriculture. And just take a brief look at it. I put together this PowerPoint for uh, Ian for sharing. So um, I'm not much on talking on PowerPoints anymore. So I really would invite conversation at any moment and any time to we can talk about that. One of the things that I, you know, I picked up uh, the San County Almanac yesterday when I was trying to find some things a part of it that I wanted to think about and talk about here. You all deal with this every day, but for me, every time I pick this up and start reading it, I'm, I'm awestruck at, and I think, Kurt, you've written about this extensively, um, these words are timeless. They're, you know, he could be writing, Ella Leopold could be writing this today, and it still rings true. Uh, that, it just it always is amazing to me. And sometimes I get a little sad by that, though. Because a lot of what he was writing about was how we need to change and save the, the, change our views and our actions to save the world. And because it's still true today, that also maybe means that we're not quite there yet and we're not doing what we need to do. Um, so hopefully, though, we can, we can think about things just a little differently and, and find a way. I've been, as Anna kind of pointed out, I have sort of a bounce around storied career in agriculture in Wisconsin of about 20 years. Uh, most of that has been around education and agriculture. And there's a few things along the way that have kind of affected me um, and changed my philosophy on, on some things. <clears throat> I don't do this often, so bear with me. <laughs> it's a new literature. One of the things, though, that I do find 
and it, it gets caught up by a guest speaker that I have from is an administrator at the Department of Agriculture in their uh, Ag Development Division. And he talks about a concept of barn blindness to farmers. And I realize that this exists for everybody. What he means by barn blindness is that we get caught up in our day-to-day -day tasks and we focus on what we have to do every day to get through the day. And that we forget that there's a bigger picture and a bigger direction that we're trying to go on the farm. And if we do that, we can forget Eventually, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble as a farm business owner. And I think that's true for an educator, too. So you get caught up in here and you start seeing the world just around you. It looks chaotic and you don't see that there's a lot of opportunities. But if you just change your paradigm a little bit, you find out that really the world is connected everywhere. So um, I guess that's a, a lesson that I learned uh, a while ago, and that's why... Uh, another reason why I wanted to come and have a conversation with you all about this, you know, uh, maybe not a topic that you get a lot, but it's something that you can uh, take or not and go forward. Uh, and that's a fun toy that your son can play with too. <laughs> <laughs> Often does break it. I'm not going to go through all this. So I'll leave it for you. The, uh, yeah, there's too many words on the slide for me, but and I'm standing in front of the projector anyway, so you can't read it. <laughs> the, uh, the one way, one way to look at conservation in agriculture, there's many ways you could look at it. Uh, real, reality is, right, agriculture has been a part of human history since civilization existed, and there's been ebbs and flows in our practices that have just maybe not been so good, and ebbs and flows in time uh, to do look at conservation. But because we're here, and because uh, Elder Leopold was involved in this, I thought we'd look at NRCS, which previously was a soil conservation service that of course started uh, the first action that they that, that came from was was the Coon Valley project that I believe Cold was involved in, the first watershed based project in, in conservation and agriculture in uh, Coon Valley, Wisconsin in 1933. Everybody's familiar with that, I believe, right? Yeah, we don't need to go into that. And then so the uh, that was kind of where things that I'm interested in working in and talking about um, started. Over the years, they've, they've changed a fair amount. Different actions have grown for them. Different laws have come into a part. And I'll leave this with Ian, and you can read through the details of it. I got it off their website. They have a nice little history of the NRCS website. So if you want to go read it there, that's fine. Uh, the part where I come in and want to start maybe focusing a little more was the farm crisis in 1980, which kind of is what made some major changes. Uh, the Farm Food Security Act of 1985, a.k.a. the first farm bill, uh, is really what changed NRCS, or the, the soil conservation at that time, into a lot of the things that they've been working on today, <clears throat> which has been a focus, a refocus on agriculture conservation practices, right? You, you start to see all these different programs that are about setting up and, and paying, helping farmers do conservation on our land and cost sharing being a big part of how that gets implemented. Um, CRP was established now, it's gone again. Um, hey, Randy, yeah. And you're not. CRP, good, thank you, Jen. Uh, CRP is a conservation reserve program. It's a intent was that on lands that were not really uh, producible, highly erodible lands was the first target of that, um, that you would set aside and put back in a more, um, mean, it usually it was grassland, sometimes forest land kind of practices. So the program was that the, the government would essentially rent the land back from the farmers so that they could uh, take that out of production. That wasn't redone in the last farm bill, and that's kind of one where you start to see some of these issues of CRP lands coming out that we talk about where you lose habitat for uh, for birds and um, ground nesting birds and things like that. Um, again, that's a little bit, we'll get into some of those in a second. 
But, and some of these others, uh, SES is the Soil Conservation Service, NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service. It was a change in title in 1994. Um, okay, so like I said, just want to do a brief history, not spend all day on that. Um, over the course of this time, there has been a lot of good work in conservation that's happened there. Um, I guess one thing that I would suggest, though, is that maybe there's some, some problems with the goals of that. One, one is the economics, this whole idea of cost sharing. Uh, and then two, um, the goal of conservation itself, which is to reduce erosion and, and try to re uh, rather than eliminate it which gets us to this big letter T. Does anybody know what T is in soil erosion terms? Good guess. This is called tolerable soil loss. Our goal of conservation is to create a farming system that is about tolerable soil loss. You might remember I'm a soil scientist by training and passion, really. In my ears, that is this not even possible. Tolerable soil loss is just something I can't wrap my mind around. I, just, I won't. It, it, it boils down to this. Our goal is to stop erosion so that we are not losing any more than two to five tons per acre per year in our farming practices. Per acre per year. Tons. Now, what does that mean? Uh, if you want to think about that in inches of soil loss, uh, a T of five, which is pretty typical on most of our medium textured soils that we have around a lot of Wisconsin, you're talking about at, um, the soil loss of about, oops, I got that, sorry, I forgot that part. You're looking at about half a millimeter a year of soil loss, which is something, or I'm sorry, it's 0.72. The soil, it's about 10 times more than what the soil actually forms in natural soil forming production. So for the last, since the 1985 Farm Bill, our goal of conservation has been to only lose, 10, to allow ourselves to give up 10 times more soil than we form every year for all these years. That would be one thing if we actually met that goal. The problem also becomes that we don't meet that goal because we get back to this economic issue of we can't tell a farmer to do this unless we can t give them cost sharing to do that. The two don't really go hand in hand. I'm not here to belittle the good work that conservation organizations do. I think they are trying and they're doing their best, but I do want to, you know, that just, it, it is a problem that we need to think about and why why I want you to be thinking about that because of your roles and people you talk to and influencers that you bring to the table. Um, the other part of this erosion is what we're talking about in that tolerable erosion is called sheet erosion. It's the, the whole field slough, sloughing off at once. It's not the gullies, it's, that's even bigger yet, that's more erosion than that. It's not what's called real erosion where you start to see the little cracks in the field. This is just the sightless little bit of soil moving at a time. The problem is that not all of that erosion leaves the field and then as the soil particles break down, a little bit of that erosion fills in and essentially destroys the soil's ability to function you're taking away the ability of the water to infiltrate by, by having this little bit of sheet erosion come over the top and fill in the cracks. The way that it creates a crust every year that you see, and then how do we deal with that management-wise? Tillage, which, comes, which then removes all the vegetation. It, it destroys all the structure in the soil and there, again, creates more <laughs> opportunity for erosion. Anyway, that's, I think everybody would agree, not a fun thing to think about and, and deal with. And of course, the big thing here is that you get these changes in, in our water cycles and we're dealing with, with uh, flooding issues all the time, right? 
So what 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 does that mean? Time for some conversation. What do, what do you think about with with erosion? How do we deal with that? Well, there are no till Yeah. No till is one of the conservation practices that actually helps us get to T. That's yeah. And it's a good thing. It, the idea is that you're trying to leave some uh, protection against, primarily against rain, striking the bare soil surface, right? That's the, what no-till is essentially about. It puts back a little bit of carbon in the system, too. That's a good, good way to go. Any other thoughts? Wind, yeah, wind's a little different erosion. This is more dealing with uh, the sheet erosion, but especially up by you in the Central Plains, the wind erosion is a, is a big issue with the sands, that's true. And the way we break that up, try to break up the fields, the length of the thing. Yeah. Rotate crops. Rotate crops, yeah. All those are definitely things that we can do to, to get at it. And those are the tools that the conservation groups have been been using and, and getting at. I guess, uh, well, move on out of there. I guess one of the things that's really exciting for me, and maybe it's not exciting for everybody because, um, but, it, but as a society, I've always noticed that we really can address things when it's a crisis. When it's not really a crisis, we don't, maybe we can sweep it under rug or we don't really do it. But I think we're at two, two places here where crises are starting to come together. All these rain events are creating flooding events and creating water events that are taking our soils and eventually, for us, depositing them in the Gulf of Mexico. And we know that that is creating this epoxy zone. And so there is a crisis around that. The other end of this is an economic crisis that's happening on the farms. The corn prices have come way, way down. And the economics of farming is such that um, you really can't afford to plant corn anymore. Every year you're losing your equity that you built up in farming by growing corn. Um, and we'll come back to that in, in just a second. But that those two forces nat are natural forces of destroying the soil's ability to function along with the economic crash in farming is giving us an opportunity really to look at things in a different way that we can start thinking about um, restoration and agriculture. Well, some of the places that restoration and agriculture that you probably think about right away, uh, or at least I do, because I've done some of them, but the uh, woody vegetation, that's happening a fair amount, where we're using animals to help us do the work that you're doing in trying to restore native habitat, right? I'm uh, on the board at Riverland Conservancy in Merrimack, and we've used goats for about uh, 10 years or so as a restoration tool to get to some of the woody vegetation. Highland cattle do a really good job too. Goats are a little easier to manage because the fences are easier, they're easier to hold in, but Highland are kind of an interesting critter. The, the bull actually will come through with his horns and he grabs all of the trees and bends them down so that the cows can feed off of the, off of the leaves. So as you get into some of the vegetation that you really can't get with goats because of height and things, Highland are a viable option. You have to have a different fencing system. They're pretty docile, really. As a, they look big and and kind of crazy, but uh, they're they're relatively docile as a uh, as far as an animal that's a bull, <laughs> a two thousand pound bull. <laughs> if you can have a relatively docile two thousand pound bull, um, and it's grazing. Uh, Dennis and Sue Mangling are grazers from Columbia County. Uh, managed grazing is is probably where soil health practices are most implemented. Oh, I gave it away. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the places that we're really you really see that it's a, the idea, of course, is mimicking, starting to mimic nature and having a diverse cropping system out there. One of the principles is plants have roots, animals have feet. Let's let the animals go out and harvest the roots, for, harvest the plants where rather than us. And so. Uh, you, it ends up being a really nice system. Um, man, you have to do the management in it. There's a lot of, you'll look around, if you drive around uh, and look at some of the pastures that are out there, 
and you see this manicured lawn looking pasture, that, that really isn't managed grazing and that's not getting to the soil health uh, impacts that a well managed pasture. Dennis, you mentioned earlier that you were starting to see um, some of some real improvements on some of your land through the practices that you. Right. Um, <clears throat> some of the things that include um, years ago they, they did uh, crop, low crop farming on there, and we had a lot of bare spots developed. So we changed that, putting cows in there. Um, they did a number of things. One, you don't let them eat the grass way down. You let them eat it down to about six inches and then move them on to the next place. Also, if you get a little bit of tall grass in there, let them trample it down, that becomes organic matter, which helps to preserve moisture into the soil. And at the same time, we're seeing a lot more worms come back, a lot more worm activity with castings and things like that. So mm -hmm. worms are important because they produce a lot of nutrients for the soil for the grass as it's growing. Right. Well, you hit on all the principles of soil health that we're going to talk about in just a minute, but that's exactly the other part is that it, it, it's something you can make a living doing. You know, uh, beef, selling beef is a profitable, uh, you had hogs out there too for a while and a, and a variety of other um, poultry and, and uh, other animals too, but it, you were able to do that pretty well, I would imagine, and, and not necessarily have to run yourself into the ground doing it. All right. All right, so that's that's nice. And it's and it's moving in the right direction. And those are great restoration practices. What I what happens though when we get to this principle of soil health for me that's really, really exciting is that this is something that can be applied on every single kind of farming practice that there is. That every, you can still grow corn and beans, although that's not my favorite practice in the world. That is something that you can still do by implementing some of these principles of soil, of soil health that we're going to, that I'm going to touch on. And it gets back to this idea of needing to change our, our way of thinking though. The way that we think about farming right now is that that's not possible and it's not doable because I'm only going to plant corn and beans because that's what I make money at. Here's where the economic opportunity comes in. The markets for corn have dropped down to now where corn is selling in somewhere around three and a half dollars a bushel. It costs about four dollars and twenty five cents to four dollars and fifty cents to plant the, that using the traditional chemical um, our traditional agriculture practices. That's not hard math to see they don't line up. You're not going to be able to keep doing that. We don't really, as a farmer, you don't have control over the markets, especially when, when you're going into commodity markets. Come back to managed grazing a second, that is something you can, when you start to raise animals and sell those animals, you can get into controlling the markets a little bit more. But with the, with Implementing soil health practices on a corn farm, the idea is diversifying your cropping system, reducing your tillage, you reduce the amount of fuel you need to, to do that work, you reduce the amount of chemical inputs to go into that because of the diversification of the cropping system using the cover crops is turned into a green manure and it, um, it just brings down the input costs enough to where you actually can come back and make money. Um, the four principles here are, you know, keeping are out there. Keep, you keep the soil covered, disturb it as little as possible, keep plants growing throughout the year, which doesn't work real well in Wisconsin winters, but we can get pretty close if you have cover crops growing most of the year, and then um, diversifying the crop of systems. What this boils down to is you're really trying to make our farming systems more into a natural mimicking a natural system and get closer to that. Uh, Justin Morris, who is our NRCS um, soil health specialist for Wisconsin and Minnesota, uh, suggests also another principle would be to add back animals into that. And so as a corn farmer, maybe you think about change your paradigm of I'm just, from producing a commodity back to this idea that farming really is about producing food first. And you put 
animals into your system, maybe you can do that only just to feed your own self and family, or you can diversify your markets by having uh, an opportunity to raise meats and, and sell those as well. But if we feed ourselves first, think of farming as a, a food production, we get back into a more uh, stable environment and the soil health um, really snaps things back. Soil health is about controlling the biology, about bringing back the biology of the soil, putting all the uh, roots back, putting back the diverse crops. It brings back this the the bacteriology and the uh, mycorrhizae, the fung fungi, that start to build back the soil structure which then starts to build back the soil pores, which gives the soil its ability to function in a water uh, system. One of the really interesting things to me is, does anybody know how long uh, natural soil formation takes? How long does it take to grow an inch of soil, naturally, approximately? A thousand years, 500 to a thousand years is about what is talked about. Soil health isn't really necessarily going to grow back soil, but it grows back that soil functionality really fast. You know, this uh, I, at Sauk County Farm, which is over by Loganville, out just south of uh, um, of Reedsburg, they started implementing just cover crops a few years ago. And one way to look at soil health is you can do a, a soil infiltration, a water infiltration test. And so they did that with a little. Um, four inch diameter pipe that you drive into the soil and you dump a cup of water in it, it, it it's mimics about a hundred year rain. It, it took over 45 minutes with just in their no-till practices for the water to infiltrate into the soil. Add in a couple of years of cover crops, they come back and, and now they're at nine, nine minutes of, so of water infiltration. That's pretty impressive, really, if you think about it. And what does it do? The, Instead of that water in a rain event coming down, it's not going to sit there for 45 minutes if it's not captured, right? That's going straight into our streams. In nine minutes, time, some of it at least, is going to be absorbed in. Not all of it's going to run off, right? We, we effectively started to get the soil back to us, its ability to function. Good question, Anna. Thank you. The what's happening is that you have a symbiotic relationship between the biological organisms that live in the soil and the plants that are there and growing. Plants, of course, are green on top. They're gathering energy, but they store sugars in their roots, right? And then the mycorrhizae fungus, they don't produce anything themselves. They need somebody else to produce food for them. They still respire, so they still use sugars for energy. And that relationship, having those plants in place, having those living roots is what starts to build back that functionality to give the mycorrhizae and other bacteria an opportunity to live. Those things in turn provide the glue that starts to create structure in the soil, which brings back, the, opens up the pores, opens up the soil. The other parts, Dennis mentioned earthworms, they're a problem in some environments, but in a farm field, they open up channels and move things up and down and, and do some work that, that is pretty functional in the, in the soil system. Um, there are, all these things are happening because you have that ability of the, point, the, the more diverse root system and, and having those uh, available sugars that aren't there elsewhere. The more diversity that you can add into that, the more opportunity there is to grow. That This cover crop mix out there is a four, four species cover crop. There's um, some of the um, soil health farmers that are really taught out. If you go out on YouTube and you look up soil health, you'll find a farmer by the name of Gabe Brown. He's a North Dakota farmer, a corn grower from uh, North Dakota. He has something like 26 different species in his cover crop mix for his corn and, corn and soybeans alone. And then in it, he also does some beef production. Back to this idea of economic 
uh, economic uh, crisis brings opportunity. Gabe Brown started doing that because he was on his last dime. And he couldn't afford to keep farming the way he was. He couldn't afford to put the crops in using our propped up chemical based system, essentially hydroponics. It doesn't get water to the rooting system because we shut off the ability of water to infiltrate. Uh, that he, he had to try something or he was going to be out of farming. And so he started implementing cover crops and he's really just, he, he's uh, gone hog wild really about it. Um, and still today, there are, I think three generations of Browns are on that farm raising families and doing quite well. Um, and he's a national speaker, of course. Gets paid pretty nicely to go around and talk about that. I don't know that every farmer wants to do that. A lot of us, a lot of folks go into farming for other reasons. The conversation part? Right. Kurt, that's a great summary and, and exactly um, why it's so important, is, I think, that we're talking about it here, because because it does bring full circle Aldo Leopold's work and why it's important. Um, soil health has is, is actually been used by uh, components of it, or is a component of something bigger called soil quality that it was a, a major push in the 90s. Um, Again, at a time of economic crisis, things were able to change. Last night, I was at the Sauk County's uh, is redoing their land and water management plan, and they have a. I was asked to be on our advisory board, and we had a meeting. They were looking at different practices that they could implement, and my comment and others was, you know, soil health really fits in all these things: surface water, groundwater, agricultural lands, um, but. It struck me again that, you know, one of the comments that came from a, a staff member was at $8 corn, conservation is something you can do. And I think this is where we have to think about how do we change mindsets here. That's wrong. That's backwards. It's that really at $3 corn that conservation becomes not just possible but necessary to continue on. And it really opens up the opportunities. What are some of the problems that we talk about in agriculture? You have to go big or get out, right? Well, that's no longer true. If you can have a 100-acre farm and, and make a profit on it, well, you can raise a family doing, doing that. You, family agriculture is possible. Managed grazing is a perfect example, really, of how family agriculture can, can survive and survive well. I mean, Dennis, you're, what do you guys got, about 80 acres of pasture, was it? I'm sorry, I don't it's, um, you know, look at uh, our pasture versus the acre. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're looking at approximately 50, 60 percent um, for the hay fields and the rest of the pasture. Yeah. And you can do that on a reasonable amount of land. 
and I make a good living. Um, that's a I'm a, I'm excited about that. We there's a number of people um, starting in my generation. You millennials think you get all the great tips for going off, but us Xers are there too, right, Jan? <laughs> We've been doing it. The back to the land ideas are important, though. And a lot of millennials really don't want to live in cities anymore. You want to have this ag agrarian, this ability to live off the land. You can do quite well managed grazing as a managed grazing farmer, especially if you think about what are you trying to do. If you think about feeding your family first, free, you can. The beauty of this, really. Direct, if you get into direct marketing, that takes up a little bit of time, but you can manage a lot of animals in relatively short amount of time every day. You can. I worked with a farmer out of uh, Dick Ryan outside of Lodi. I, he raised over 500 head of uh, of beef steer of beef steers every year. He'd get up every morning at five. Now that might seem a little bit harsh, but he get up every morning at five, work till seven. He'd go off and do something else. And he'd come back at 5 at night and work until 7, and he managed this whole 500 head of cattle. And in that time, he was able to do something else. Now, that attracts me. I love, love being an agriculture education, educator. I love that I got this job at MATC. I pinch myself often because it's really nice. I have summers off. I get to do... <laughs> I make it decent. I'm happy with where we're at there. You know, there's a lot of fun things that you get to do. But now I can also think about, well, maybe, maybe I can farm in there and, and do that too and, and have the time to still do that. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people manage it that way. Um, so I'll just finish this out before the computer dies. Again, I, you guys are change makers and, and really, in order to start to get to some of these things, to change these paradigms in, we, we need everybody to start talking about this as a possibility. Um, I'm going to do it. I made it a, in my program last year, Jen helped me uh, with this, Kurt helped me with this too. I, we have a, I have an outcome in every single one of my classes that I teach that connects the land ethic. You know, ha have farmers define their land ethic. Farmers love the land that they work on. They, they love it. And there's no doubt about it that it, in order to be a farmer, you are intimately connected and, and love your land. There's I, uh, one of these paradigm shifts I had I, I, uh, in 2007, I think it was, I got to be the one time, my one time keynote present, presentation at an international manure management conference. <laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> that's, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You guys know I'm full of, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, the, I was co-presenting at it with another colleague in, from Extension, and he, he started out his, his uh, conversation, we were looking at how in problems in manure management, and I, my role was to look at some of the policy issues. I had been working at the Department of Agriculture for a number of years, and I kind of had a little bit of expertise in that area. Um, and he was looking at some practices that they were trying to implement in Outagamie County. And he started out his talk by saying, I've never known a farmer to get up today and decide I'm going to destroy the earth. And, you know, that's true. There, there may be some bad landowners out and do, do some of it, but no farmer gets up every morning and says, I'm going to destroy the earth. In fact, they, they love their land. And they want to, many of them want to pass it on to the next generation or, or several generations down. The problem is that my role, our educators and, and some of the people that we've been giving them the wrong tools all along. Early on, the soil quality was what, when I I left. Uh, I started at DACAP in 2001, and I was presenting on my graduate research in about the year 2000. I was presenting on it, talking about and being apologetic because I was using in my economic model for the practices I was talking about two dollar corn that they would sell it, and they couldn't get two dollar corn. Well, in the income interim of that time, what we had this gigantic boom in, in corn prices, right? You can connect it to whatever, a lot of people connect it to ethanol, who knows, there's, uh, there's a lot of reasons that that price went up, but it sure changed a lot of opportunities for people and corn became king again. Soil quality was really taken off, 
in the early late 90s and early 2000s because we were at that point again where farmers couldn't afford to to do this chemical based uh, farming system that that time is gone the the markets have crashed again and a lot of the forecasters say they're down there forever so now we have another opportunity and out of this soil quality kit we really realize that we can focus in even more intensely around soil health. And it's really some simple principles that start to get at back to soil health. And we have this opportunity again to make big changes and, and really bring this around uh, in, in our farming practices. But we also have to do this, and why I bring come to you, not just because of the farming practices, but because you're also you're connected in a lot of ways, and some of this has to be political, right? That T, that, that whole concept of T is a policy. And what is a policy? It's some kind of a cross of science and political will that we say we're, we're willing to accept as a society, right? There's other ways to define it, but that's the way I look at it. It helps me wrap my mind around it. But the problem with that is the, nature doesn't really give a shit what policies we put out there. And we're at a time where we really need to bring nature into our policies a little more. And this gives us an opportunity, in my view, to do that in a way that, that you don't have to necessarily be um, in your face about it. Anna mentioned that I, I got to be the education director for uh, our agriculture programs. I was also the education director in that time for our renewable energy programs in the WTCS. One of the things I learned in that is that there's a lot of people want renewable energy to happen because it's important for the environment. I think most of us in this room probably feel pretty strongly that that's important. And a good reason that we ought to get into renewable energy in this building is a, a great example of, of doing that, right? But that doesn't necessarily resonate with everybody. Sometimes it's about how can I save money and better my family. Sometimes it's just about, well, renewable energy is a good place to go and do get a good job. You know, uh, there is a woman, uh, Robin Farrow. I don't if anybody knows her. Uh, she was a consultant during that time with a lot of in Madison. I never met her, and I never read her book, but she wrote this book called You Don't Have to Wear Hemp Underwear. And it really changed my paradigm. I, I went to her website and looked at it. She had on there a self-identification tool for you to decide on natural resources where you fit, from the extremely I'm living off-grid, I'm going to you know, make my own clothes, to you know, I love snowmobiling, and I want to go fast, but I need the, the natural environment to fit. And she put together a bunch of little tools in each one to help people think about it just a little bit more. You're never going to get this group to be this group, and you're never going to get this group to, well, maybe this group is better off, so we don't have to worry about them. But how do you get, you know, having this message and talking about it to everybody is how we really can get this done. And that's, that's why I wanted to share this uh, with you. I really do believe that agriculture uh, can be a restoration tool. And, of course, for me, the most important thing, um, I want to pass this on, this world, on to my son. And I hope that we can have those resources to do that. So, thank you. All right.